Voices from the Past, An Age of Democracy and Progress. Emmeline Pankhurst, Soldier in the Struggle for Women's Rights. Deeds, not words. That was Emmeline Pankhurst's motto as she fought for the right to vote for British women in the early 1900s. To get the lawmakers' attention and force them to act, she and her followers set fires, broke windows, slashed pictures, and staged hunger strikes. Pankhurst believed that she was waging a war to win voting rights for women, and she was a soldier fighting for a cause that consumed her life. Pankhurst didn't look much like a soldier. She was slim, elegant, and well-dressed. She looked every inch the English gentlewoman. But she was a powerful leader and speaker. Her passion and dedication to women's rights inspired fierce devotion among her followers. Some of those followers included Pankhurst's own daughters. In 1879, she married a lawyer, Richard Pankhurst, who was more than 20 years her senior. Her husband also strongly supported women's rights. Before Richard died in 1889, the couple had five children. The two oldest girls, Christabel and Sylvia, would fight alongside their mother. The battle began in 1903, when Pankhurst founded the Women's Social and Political Union. At first, the organization just tried to get working women to join their cause. But after a while, Pankhurst became discouraged. No one in the government was talking about giving the vote to women. The newspapers had stopped covering the union's activities. Their nice, polite protests were being completely ignored. It was time for a change in tactics. In 1905, Christabel and a fellow union member went to a meeting where a minister in the British government was speaking. During his speech, the women kept loudly demanding to know when the government planned to give women the vote. When the police tried to take them away, the women put up a struggle. For the first time, physical resistance had been used in the women's rights movement. The police arrested the women on assault charges, bringing their cause much needed attention. Emmeline Pankhurst began using extreme measures to attract attention to the cause in 1907. For the next seven years, she and her followers staged attacks on private property, not people. They broke streetlights, set fire to mailboxes and buildings, and even attacked golf courses. Pankhurst was fearless of the consequences. She claimed that she was offering the British government two choices. Either women are to be killed, or women are to have the vote. The government didn't kill the women, but it did punish them. Officials jailed Pankhurst's followers and sentenced them to hard labor but the women went on hunger strikes. Their jailers responded by force-feeding the prisoners. They shoved rubber tubes down the women's noses or throats, sometimes breaking their teeth in the process. Pankhurst herself was never force-fed. The government probably feared that her followers would seek revenge. Lawmakers also feared the outcry that would result if any of the weakened hunger strikers died. So they passed the Cat and Mouse Act. Under this law, a woman on a hunger strike would be released from jail until she regained her strength. She would then be rearrested so that she could finish serving her sentence. In 1912 alone, the 54 year old Pankhurst was released and returned to prison 12 times. The outbreak of World War I in 1914 ended the Union's demonstrations as women united behind the war effort. After the war ended in 1918, the British government finally granted women over 30 the right to vote. The right was extended to women over 21 in 1928, just a few weeks before Pankhurst died at the age of 69. Section 1, and it's all about democratic reform and activism. You see, if one person goes on strike, no one cares. By person, they're replaced the next day. If 100 people go on strike, depending on the size of the company, it might still not have an effect. Remember Lowell, Massachusetts, 800 people went on strike. Still no effect. But you can't fire the entire country. And eventually, the governments of both Great Britain and France were forced to make some changes.
So it's got to get bad before we get to this point where people get that involved. Um, but let's talk about kind of where we were. Democracy. Yay! 1776, we have a Declaration of Independence, we have a Constitution. Yay, it's all super democratic, right? Not if you're a woman. Not if you're black. Nope. Democracy doesn't apply to you if you're a woman or if you're a black. And by the way, you didn't even get to vote in 1800, really until 1828 in the United States. You didn't get to vote unless you were white, you were male, and you owned property. Obviously, women could not vote at all until 1920. So, upper classes really ran the government. I'd say the richest 5% of most Western European and American countries, the wealthiest 5% really ran the government. So do we have a democracy, Brooklyn? No, we don't. We don't have a democracy. We say we do. On paper, it looks like we do, but not really. So we've made some changes, obviously, but let's get us up to that point. So a reform bill was passed in 1832, granting people in the middle class the right to vote in Great Britain. Um, this also gave people living in cities more representation because guess what? You no longer had to own property to vote because if you live in a city, you probably rent something. George Orwell, whose real name was Eric Blair, was born on June 25, 1903, in India. His father was a civil servant in the Indian government who worked in India until he retired. The baby Eric returned to England with his mother before he was a year old. The strong family ties to India, however, meant that he was to feel an affinity with the East into his manhood. Ida Blair and her two children, Marjorie and Eric, settled into the small town of Henley-on-Thames, some way upriver from London. Famous for its annual regatta, where crews compete from around the world, Henley is a pleasant place, surrounded by fields and meadows. Ida was 18 years younger than her husband, and had a strong, independent spirit, so she could probably cope with having to run the small family on her own. At this time, the suffragette movement was trying to win the vote for women. Ida didn't march, but she strongly supported their efforts. Perhaps she passed some of her social conscience to her son. The Blairs were quite well off, so they soon moved to a larger house. Eric went to a small Anglican church school in Henley, where he won a scholarship to a nearby preparatory school for boys called St. Cyprian's. From here you stood a good chance of getting into one or other of the best schools in England. A year later in 1912, Mr. Blair retired. They moved house again and settled in a village just outside Henley. As a writer, Orwell was not slow off the mark. He early announced he was to be a writer, and by the age of 11 had a patriotic poem about the First World War printed in the local newspaper. Oh, give me the strength of the lion, the wisdom of Reynard the fox, and then I'll hurl troops at the Germans and give them the hardest of knocks. His closest friend at St. Cyprian's was Cyril Connolly, 
who was also to succeed as a writer. Together they read Kipling and H.G. Wells and even Bernard Shaw and Samuel Butler. Blair was given Swift's Gulliver's Travels for his eighth birthday. As a satirist, Orwell has often been compared to Swift. Okay, so another important movement is the Charitist movement. The Charitist movement was all about expanding the vote and reforming policies to make countries more democratic. The absolute demand of the Charitist movement was that all men should be able to vote. Sorry, women. That votes should be secret, meaning you should not be required to tell people who you vote for because doesn't that ruin the whole purpose? Because that's super awkward when you didn't vote for your best friend for student body president. Well, okay. Um, and you should have the right not to tell them. Now, that's the, that's the point. If your vote is not secret, can't you just be pressured to vote in a certain way? Yeah, who are you voting for for student body president? Um, 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 Satan? Okay. <laughs> um, well, you should vote for me. But, but Satan. But you should vote for me. Well, actually, but, 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 no, no, vote for me. Um, and so people would peer pressure you into voting for you. Um, now, Parliament at first, the lawmaking body in Great Britain said, go away, people. This whole idea that you all can vote? No. I mean, who are you, crazy? What do you think, we're going to let poor people vote now? Honestly, that's what they were saying. What do you think, we're going to let the uneducated vote? They can't read. What makes you think they can pick leaders? I've been in school for a million years. Maybe I should be able to vote. Maybe you shouldn't, right? And so that was, it was a lot of elitist types of feelings that led Parliament to at first reject, but yes, they eventually reached these goals because they wouldn't go away. And more and more people kept showing up. Queen Victoria was the monarch of Great Britain for 64 years, ruled over a time when Britain was at the height of its power, when it could actually be said that the sun never set on the British Empire. They had amassed the largest empire the world has ever seen. But this monarch actually lost power to Parliament, especially the House of Commons, which is basically like our House of Representatives in Congress right now. By the end of her reign, she was but a figurehead, even though the empire was the most powerful it's ever been. A democratically elected prime minister served as the chief executive, and parliament served as the lawmaking body. And she still got to live in the palace, she still got to wear the crown, she still got to call herself queen, but she was basically a figurehead by the end of her reign. Women would eventually get the right to vote in the United States, in Great Britain, and in other countries. But to get the right to vote was a very long, often tedious, sometimes violent process. Because again, women said, we want the right to vote. And men responded, are you kidding me? You shouldn't be able to vote? Are you crazy? Do you know who you are? You're a woman. No, go away. Back to the kitchen. And, and I mean, seriously, it's obviously offensive. I don't mean it. I'm just trying to say from their point of view, can you imagine being told that? Well, that's what these women were being told. I'm, I'm telling you, there was a book that was popular, big bestseller, handbook, kind of like a guidebook to be a good wife. It was written in the early 1800s, around the time that this movement was going on. And it said, and I quote, the only chemistry a woman needs to know is how to boil water. The only geography a woman needs to know is how to get around her own house. I know, right? I feel weird saying that, but it's true. Women could not legally own property in the United States in the early 1800s. They did not have legal guardianship of their own children. What? In the early 1800s. If her husband passed, her property and guardianship of her children went to her husband's nearest male relative. And that's a very ancient culture, in fact. So, 
now women are saying we want the right to vote. And you have these millennia of patriarchy. And, and, and men are just saying no. Um, they argued, A, it's way too radical. I mean, millennia of tradition. B, uh, women are not suited to engage in political matters. In fact, the Bible discourages it. Yeah, look up 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. Um, it says, and I quote, and remember this is kind of, you know, we're talking about a heavily Protestant region, you know, kind of deeply Christian area. So here's the verse. It says, women are to remain silent in the churches. If they have a question, let them ask their husbands at home. I'm just telling you that's in there. And guess what? People were quoting it and using that to say women shouldn't be able to vote. But you know what? I'm, I'm really proud that I get to tell you about women that wouldn't shut up. I'm really proud that I get to tell you about women like Emmeline Pankhurst, who formed the Women's Social and Political Union. And this movement not only staged protest, they would often show up to vote anyway. Oh, you're telling me I can't vote? Stop me. What are you going to do about it? Well, they'd go to jail. Okay. Me and 10,000 of my best friends who showed up to vote here, you're going to send us all to jail? All right. We'll get the next group and the next group. We'll fill up the jails, and then where are you going to put us? Because they wouldn't stop. They wouldn't go away. And guess what? It worked. But in the United States, it took 70 years. 70 years. It's in there, right? The movement of women's suffrage begins to gain steam in the latter part of the 19th century and was tied into other issues. Not only did leaders of uh, women seek the right to vote, uh, but they sought uh, to be free from other civil disabilities where civil disabilities were in place when it came to things such as uh, property ownership and the right to bring lawsuits uh, in, their own, uh, in their own name and in their own right and so forth. But the linchpin of the uh, women's movement of those days uh, really was uh, the issue of voting. In 1875, in a case called Minor versus Haberstadt, the court argued a, a case involving a woman named Virginia Minor who wants to vote and argues under the privileges and immunities of the 14th Amendment. She should have the right to vote. The court's ruling there was the qualifications to vote were set by the state and not by the national government. And that if the state did not want to give women the right to vote, they didn't have to. Uh, some of the most prominent leaders uh, of, the, of the women's suffrage movement were also leaders in other uh, areas. For example, uh, Susan B. Anthony, uh, a Quaker lady, uh, a single woman, uh, an activist on behalf of many women's causes, was also involved in the abolition movement to abolish slavery. Uh, also involved in the temperance movement to, to, to fight uh, alcoholism, and also, interestingly, uh, involved in the movement against abortion, trying to strengthen by legislation uh, uh, common law prohibitions and restrictions on abortion. Susan B. Anthony, her likeness now emblazoned on the one dollar coin, was the most notable figure of women's suffrage, although there were others, like Lucy Stone and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, out of the women's suffrage movement, a new generation of female leaders grew, like Carrie Chapman Catt, who founded the League of Women Voters. Carrie Chapman Catt formed the League of the Women Who Had Been Fighting for Suffrage and made the point that we had the right to vote. There were 20 million women in the country. We needed to be educated to make the right choice. Gaining the franchise for women finally succeeded. With the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, women at last had the right in all states to vote, but it passed by a slim margin. When the vote comes to the four, uh, the House votes for it, the Senate does not. The United States Senate has to come back in a special session and votes for it, and it, despite the fact that no southern state supported it, uh, the 19th Amendment's adopted in 1920. That's right. No southern states voted in favor. 
No southern state, not one. All of them rejected it. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I just feel like I'm going to get slapped for that one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Woo! Is my face red? It should be. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, now, now, again, interpretations of ancient documents change with time. So you read that, you interpret that how you choose. I'm just telling you that people were interpreting that back then to say, you know, you get it. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on before I get myself in more trouble. Um, so, so meanwhile, in France, the French government formed in 1875. Um, this is the Third Republic, so kind of the third attempt at a democratic French government. It did la it man This time it managed to last 60 years. Yay. Um, but there were some serious problems with France and democracy. For one, like the Dreyfus Affair, um, the the French government was spying on their own people. And in particular, they were spying on Jewish people. And, and it was really evident that even though France was all like, yay, team democracy, they really only meant it for white males. Go figure. Certainly not for Jews. Uh, eventually, the government declared this Jewish officer in the French army innocent, but the case itself, when it went public, really revealed a lot of anti-Semitic tensions in France. After he finished the 20 novels which make up the rougon macart series, Zola turned to new but equally controversial fields. He wrote a series of three novels under the heading of The Three Cities, Les Trois Villes. The cities were Lourdes, Rome, and Paris. He began with Lourdes because he saw the pilgrimages there as a calculated fraud on the part of the church. Emotional capital was being squeezed out of the sufferings of the poor pilgrims who struggled so hard to get there, believing they would be cured. The novel is about a young priest who, through his exposure to all this, begins to question his faith in God. In the next book, Rome, center of the Roman Catholic Church, the same priest encounters the scheming of the leaders of the church for their own advancement. In the final work, Paris, Zola turns his attention to the business world, where his contemporaries were so often being duped into investing their money in spurious businesses, which spectacularly failed. In 1894, President Carnot was assassinated by an anarchist in a wave of business scandals and terrorist unrest, and as usual, Zola was topical and potent. This last work, however, was overshadowed by Zola's personal involvement in the Dreyfus affair. He wrote his famous letter, J'accuse. Zola was 58, at the height of his powers, honoured and acclaimed by many, though abhorred by many also. Yet in this letter he put everything he had gained at stake. Given the circumstances in France at the time, it could even be said he risked his life. An army officer of good report, Captain Dreyfus was wrongly accused of giving military secrets to the Germans. Although the evidence was flimsy and pointed at another officer as the culprit, Dreyfus was condemned by a military court and sent to life imprisonment on Devil's Island. Although soon aware of their errors, the military high command did not wish to admit to making a mistake, and the fact that Dreyfus was a Jew added to the unlikelihood of his being released, pardoned, or given restitution. It was a sorry mess, and the whole nation joined in. J'accuse was the article through which Zola declared himself, and accused the army so directly and bluntly of wrongdoing that he was tried, and of course found guilty of treason, and had to flee to England. In the eyes of the establishment he was poison, but to the democratically minded, and particularly the young, he was noble. He lived variously in Surrey, 
just outside London, for about a year, while the Dreyfus affair continued to tear France apart. Dreyfus was not just about a Jew who was victimised, but a symptom of the corruption in the French army, bureaucracy and government, which Zola so despised. At the time, in England, nothing so noble was going on in literature. London was obsessed with Oscar Wilde and his sexual meanderings, and Ernest Zola and his support of Dreyfus must have seemed almost incomprehensible to the British establishment for whom artists meant rather little. They were certainly not expected to interfere in politics. He returned to Paris in January 1899, when a general amnesty was declared over the affair and those concerned in it. It was not over, of course, and in fact he did not live to see Dreyfus totally exonerated and given back his commission in the army. Also, I wanted to point out that uh, there was a very powerful movement, a very popular movement called Zionism. And that was that Jewish people who had been wandering through Europe and Asia for a couple thousand years at this point began to claim and began to plan to move to Israel. Well, at this time, there was no such thing as Israel. In the 1800s, Israel did not exist. Sorry, guys. It's been wiped off the map. The Romans killed them all and made the rest leave. That was A.D. 70. So what is traditional Israel? It's the Ottoman Empire. What was it before that? It was Judea, a province of the Roman Empire. What was it before that? Well, okay, okay. So for a couple year, hundred year period of history, it was the nation state of Israel. What was it before that? Well, that's where the Jebusites lived. Yeah, so for 200 years of history, uh, there was a nation state of Israel. Uh, but of course, the Jews considered that their homeland. They consider that, you know, as part of the promised covenant. And so people began to claim, hey, we should, we should go back to our homeland. And, and so that movement began to grow, especially after the Dreyfus Affair, when Jewish people began to feel threatened in France, which, by the way, many French Jewish people would be carted off to concentration camps during the Holocaust. On May 14, 1948, the dream of an ancient people became a reality. The state of Israel was created. Fittingly, the first prime minister of the new nation was David Ben-Gurion, an early and determined advocate of Zionism. Zionism is the belief that the Jewish people should be allowed to establish their own country in Palestine, the biblical promised land of the Jews. Ben-Gurion had worked for the creation of a Jewish state since 1919. He would now lead the new country along with President Chaim Weizmann. The Arabs who already lived in Palestine looked upon the Israelis as intruders. Fighting between the Arabs and Israelis began almost immediately. As Ben-Gurion's forces defended themselves against Jordan and the Palestinians, they moved well into territory originally set aside for the Arabs. In 1949, Americans welcomed Ben-Gurion and his wife Paula when they visited the United States. But Israel's leader knew that difficult times for his country were just beginning. Ruling a people who had had no homeland or central authority for centuries would take all of his political know-how and commanding personality. Ben-Gurion had to be part George Washington and part the biblical King David. He struggled to maintain a balance between modern democracy and ancient tradition among his people. With its large Jewish population, New York City gave Ben-Gurion a hero's welcome. At Princeton University, he met Albert Einstein, who was also an enthusiastic Zionist. In 1956, Egypt controlled the Suez Canal and decided not to let Israeli ships use it. Ben-Gurion sent Israel's armed forces to attack Egypt. Eight days later, with the help of Britain and France, they occupied the entire Sinai Peninsula. The United Nations intervened and sent peacekeeping forces to occupy the disputed land. As soon as the Israeli troops withdrew in 1967, Egypt set up another blockade. During the famous Six-Day War that followed, Israel gained back all the territory it had lost and more. 
war-weary Ben-Gurion pleaded for Israel to return all the occupied territory in the name of peace, but the leaders refused. Six years later, David Ben-Gurion died. The nation he helped create still stands, but the region of Palestine is as far from peace as ever.